let's get going. Um, the first thing I wanted to do today was just uh, look at what the very end of the first lecture where we got cut off because I think the principles that he articulates um, are fairly important. So let me know when you can see my screen. Yeah, Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so the questions that he kind of uh, um, asks and answers right at the after the pizza break in the class are fourfold uh, using this diagram primarily. Um, <clears throat> essentially, his comments are, this is the main network. And as you can see, the horizontal connection is not there uh, for each of the inputs. And therefore, it's a type A network. And then the type B, you can have everything going horizontally as well as downwards because you can see the past but not see yourself or the future, which is the principle. And so essentially, he points out that by taking a softmax at each of the outputs, we ensure that each output is a probabilistic value. And then by connecting the architecture of the network in such a way that each of the outputs is conditional, therefore, when you have the conditional probability set up in this way, then again, the joint distribution makes sure that it adheres to the loss of probability. Um, <clears throat> and the third thing he asks and answers is, so how do we train the network? And as you know, Sriram and others pointed out, the way to train it is just to provide the input and in the case of training, we already know the output, so we just provide that output. And remember that made is ultimately an auto encoder, so whatever is the input would be the output. Um, so we provide that and train the network. And then the interesting thing is, how do we sample from the network to generate the uh, samples that the made network provides off what it believes is the underlying distribution? And that's where the disadvantage of this kind of network uh, or autoregressive network comes into four because what you need to do is you just first generate X1, there's nothing it depends on. Then you generate, then you take that sample from the softmax here, circulate it all the way into input at uh, uh, <clears throat> X1, provide the new input X2, and then you go through the forward pass of the network to generate the next pixel, take these two guys, provide them as input X1, X2 to, uh, to the network, go through the uh, forward pass to generate. And you can imagine how, of course, when you're doing MNIST, it's 28 by 28, so it's fairly simple, but even for that, it takes, apparently when this structure architecture was originally constructed about 10 to 11 minutes to go through and generate a full MNIST image. but the reason I wanted to touch on it was more the fact that, you know, these are some of the questions that we are, that would be relevant to each. Like, how do we maintain the probabilistic values or adhere to the loss of probability as we generate the outputs in any of the network, autoregressive networks we set up? And finally, how do we train and how do we sample? So those questions will be relevant to any future networks that we look at as well. Okay, I'll stop sharing and switch to the um, <clears throat> slide that he uses. Let me know when you can see that. Yes. Okay, so the next thing after made that he gets into are these uh, masked convolutions, which are either 1D or 2D. The 1D convolutions would be the example of WaveNet. Um, and he talks about, let's just look at 1D as, you know, these inputs coming, for example, it could be audio values, let's say single <coughs> dimension 
or uh, you know it's not in 2d it's just a single uh, uh, dimension um, or 1d input i should say and then we use multiple layers again and here the idea of what being done would be that there's some parameter sharing. So the idea is that at the first layer, which is closest to the input, all of the values for the parameters would be shared among these two input filters that are being used. Same thing here, and then you could share another set of parameters here, and then one set of parameters here. Uh, and therefore you have what in this network, let's say four sets of uh, parameters that your uh, four sets of parameters and each of those parameters are being shared. The idea here uh, as for any convolutional network is that at the lower layers, the um, <clears throat> the low level information is kind of independent of where you are in your um, screen. And that's why here you're detecting things that are at a lower level and then here at, at a higher level of what uh, <clears throat> you'd like to detect. And of course, the trade-off there is keep in mind that we want to see as far back into the inputs as reasonable because they may be impacting our output and therefore there's a trade-off because what you, um, the trade-off is that the bigger your receptive field, uh, the more you can look back <clears throat> and allow for these uh, values to implement your, uh, to influence your value. Um, on the other hand, the farther back you go, um, <clears throat> you know, the slower your training is going to be because now you need to factor in all of those inputs. So here a trade-off is obvious that you know, the wider the receptive field, um, and obviously the receptive field can be made wider and wider by having deeper and deeper layers. Um, when you have smaller receptive field, then it's faster to train and lesser parameters. But um, if you have <clears throat> deeper networks and larger uh, receptive fields, then the network is slower to train, but probably better in the sense that it has much more parameters and takes into account more of the data from uh, the past, right? So that's the kind of uh, concept. Uh, and this is just a mass temporal 1D convolution example. And then we go to the actual WaveNet um, example, and he kind of talks to this. Again, I'll switch from the slides to give a visual demonstration of what um, a WaveNet setup looks like from his video. If we play it, it kind of shows you how the network generates the output. So we saw the network in action. The difference in this case is um, use of the dilated convolution and the dilated convolution essentially implies that we are going back into the network in larger uh, steps. We can't quite see it, but we saw uh, here in the slide, but we saw that in the uh, media demonstration. And that allows you to go further back uh, than when you just take the last two inputs. Uh, the other thing he discusses at some length is the fact that here for the wave nets, 
and in fact he mentions that it is more common in autoregressive networks to use a the residual connection but also this gated type of structure where the same uh, input goes into two different streams, if you will, uh, one to a tanH and the other to a sigmoid. And the comment he makes is that tanH is the actual signal that we are seeking, and the sigmoid acts as a gate. And the setup is somewhat reminiscent of a LSTM type of network, where the purpose of the sigmoid is to act as a gate to the tanH. The, uh, the underlying concept being the sigmoid between being between zero and one. The closer the sigmoid is to zero, it doesn't allow the signal to propagate. The closer it is to one, it allows the tanf signal to propagate. So the sigmoid acts as a gate to the tanf signal, which is the uh, to the tanf output, which is the desired signal. But then it gets modulated by the sigmoid. So this particular network. Um, of WaveNet is what was used, um, <clears throat> uh, was invented by uh, <clears throat> at DeepMind and then used to uh, provide a lot of speed synthesis and results for speed synthesis, which are kind of state of the art. So that is the 1D uh, or dealing with the autoregressive concept in one dimension. And then an example of how you could use WaveNet for, again, creating the, uh, or as an autoregressive network on MNIST data. Obviously, this is, again, not what is, we would get much better results with what we are about to see in the rest of the lecture. But here, it's just to illustrate the fact that you can apply the same concepts um, once you have flattened the MNIST data, then you can apply WaveNIST uh, on it just like we did MADE and just like we did the uh, RNN network. Of course, the results are nowhere near any, uh, any good uh, on WaveNet, but we can do the same trick we did with um, RNNs and encode the XY coordinates of the pixel. And by the way, there was a question in Slack of, how do you actually provide and somebody responded you could just encode the pixel uh, locations in the MNIST because it's just a 28 by 28 um, matrix and in fact um, you know peek a little bit ahead into the homework and the homework code and the collab code provide examples of how this encoding can be done so it's a uh, code example is available of how to um, you know kind of provide the coordinates to the pixel image as well. But as you can see, while the output is a little better, it's not significantly better. And in fact, uh, MADE and other networks provide much better uh, output than what you see here. And of course, some of the stuff we'll be seeing going forward would be even further improvements on what you see at the 20th epoch uh, with MNIST input to WaveNet, even with the XY coordinates attached. Any questions so far? Okay, now we get to the kind of the uh, major, uh, at least what was state of the art a couple of years back with respect to dealing with pixels. So the idea is the following, that we want to stick with the fundamental concepts of what we established in MAID, which is the fact that autoregressive networks should only focus on the past. They cannot look at themselves, meaning the current value of wherever they are and um, anything in the future. They should only look at, they should be looking only at the past. And can we though use that concept or overlay that concept on convolutions which take advantage of the structural similarity or the structural benefits of um, <clears throat> what's going on in two-dimensional or images, uh, two-dimensional values or images. So that's the basic problem we are trying to solve uh, in many of the future networks that we'll be looking at. Uh, so to repeat, the idea is uh, for autoregressive networks, we can't look at ourselves or the future 
and can we make use of the structure? Remember that so far all of our networks, whether it was made or RNN or even WaveNet, we had to flatten the MNIST images and by flattening, we basically eliminated any correlation. So pixel 29, the fact that it was sitting below pixel one uh, or 28, if there is zero indexing, then that information is completely lost, which we know from CNN and evaluation of uh, the images is very important. So can we use convolutional neural networks to uh, and still implement the autoregressive ideas? So along came this picture about um, <clears throat> the pixel CNN. So where images can be flattened into 1D, uh, this is exactly what I said, but can we use the mass variant uh, to impose the autoregressive ordering? Now keep in mind that the raster scan ordering means that you start at the left top and then go to the right end of the image and then start again at the uh, below X1 and go through and so on and so forth. And this is an N F in Nancy squared uh, pixel image. So what kind of, now one way we could do this is just allow all of the convolutions and everything to take place and then at the end deal with the problem of which uh, connections in the network to eliminate. But that, unlike in case of the full connected network, uh, like MADE and so on, becomes extremely complicated because of the receptive field and how that grows as we stack the layer. So instead, a better approach or an easier approach um, would be to not have to prune the connections at the end, allowing no restrictions to the rest of the uh, setup. Instead, flip the problem and try to do the uh, masking, not at the end, but at every filter, if you will, uh, or by masking the filters that are used to perform the convolutional operation. So this is what the pixel CNN uh, begins to uh, kind of address. So the idea here is you set up a mask of the following kind for the filter. And the goal is to generate the pixel, which is in the middle of the three by three uh, matrix or uh, filter that you see here. And for this, as long as you set up the mask structure this way, you're adhering to the autoregressive rules because for the center pixel, all of the pixels above it, including the one to the right of it on the top, or including the direct, the one directly on the path, are pixels in the past. And this pixel one in the same row to its left is also has been generated in the past. But anything starting with itself and to the right or to the bottom of it are future pixels and therefore cannot be looked at. So as long as this is the mass setup, you're fine in your complied with the autoregressive uh, concept, if you will. And then, um, <clears throat> so if you use these four pixels and slide, uh, uh, then the thing that becomes interesting is what happens when you begin to stack the layer and how does the receptive field grow? Um, and you can kind of see as I push through and the after we have gone through the forward passes and we look at the softmax sampling of each of the outputs, this is the kind of uh, softmax distribution that you see on the right. And then you begin to see the uh, pixels emerge, which seem to indicate that there's some kind of an animal in the image. Um, the one problem, if you work through the receptive field of the subsequent pixels after the three by three, if you begin to work at, okay, what are the pixels that are masked or unmasked for each of the other green pixels in my original image uh, or in my original filter? So if I were to go back and look at this guy, if this pixel were to be the pixel that I'm generating, then what does the mask look like, which would be kind of the receptive field for 
this pixel and same thing for this pixel and so on and so forth. So if we go about doing that analysis uh, and draw the pixels and the mass yourself, then it's fairly obvious that what would what you would begin to see is if you were focusing on this black pixel, you will be able to see and factor in all of these additional pixels as input. So you can see any pixel above here, but you begin to develop a blind spot. That is the pixels in this hash mark area are not in any way influencing the pixel value of this dark pixel. Um, and the more to the right of the image you are, the less the blind spot is, and sometimes it doesn't even exist, but the more to the left of the image you are and lower you are in the image, the bigger your blind spot is going to be. And that obviously is not a desired um, uh, or uh, thing to have because it means that these blind spots, whatever is in your blind spot, if it has an impact on you, you will never see that. So that it depends on what kind of an object or, uh, or pixel you are generating and whether the value of this pixel is indeed dependent on the uh, things you see in this spot. But it is entirely possible that this pixel ought to be influenced and in, uh, with just the basic CNN, that will never be possible. So that's one of the flaws or drawback besides the fact that the inference or sampling is low uh, that's a continuing problem with all autoregressive models, but in this pixel CNN case, the additional significant problem is that a blind spot is developed so that the pixel values for this black are, uh, pixel are not dependent on certain subset of the pixels in the blind or, or in the whole image, or basically none of the pixels in the blind spot influence it. So then the improvements to pixel CNN were proposed, the, uh, and we'll look at multitude of them as we go through the rest of uh, the lecture. And the next significant one, uh, each of these, I believe, at the end of the the last slide in the lecture provides references to each of these. Uh, I also found um, both notebooks discussing the implementation, which we'll have a couple of chances to go through as. Um, uh, we go through the homework and um, the Colab notebook, um, but there are few pointers and few people who have worked through the problem and also a couple of videos that are available. Um, so I'll post links to that once we get through this uh, lecture. But the next improvement was the gated pixel CNN. Again, the attempt here is to eliminate this blind spot that we saw. So here, how does it do that? Well, it tries to divide the problem into two, uh, two steps. One of focusing on all of the pixels on the stack that's above you, because you can use all the pixels all the way, including the pixels in what would have been the blind spot for just the pixel CNN. And then if we did that, um, the issue is, we are ignoring this purple pixels within our same row and to the left. And the way to tackle that problem is to create a horizontal stack for every pixel, which would start at either the left end or if you are padding, then with whatever the padding is, and then begin to go through that row. So you now have two inputs that you need to combine, if you will, of input from the vertical stack, that's all of this stuff here, and an input from the horizontal stack of pixels, which is in the same row to your left. And you combine those two. Now, as, with, as is often done with, um, uh, you know, in neural networks and uh, deep learning is you just combine them and simplistically by adding them and provide some parameters for the network to learn as to how best to combine or weigh these two. Because obvi it's obvious that this space for a typical pixel, again, if you will way up here, that might not be very relevant, but in the middle and as you go down, 
the vertical stack contribution obviously is much more, or there are many more pixels in the vertical stack which are influencing this particular pixel compared to the pixels, uh, number of pixels in the same row. So obviously you need to weigh the vertical stack more than you do the horizontal stack, but instead of trying to figure it out, you make the network learn the weights as to how to combine that as well. Uh, again, that's an interesting piece of code, code that we probably ought to pay attention to as we look at the homework as to how these two things are combined. So one of the things, at least for me, as I went through was made notes on what specific things I would be looking for to understand better as we go through the homework code and the collab code. This combination is an interesting one. Um, and similarly, you know, the sampling of the softmax on the output is an interesting one, at least uh, uh, in order to generate the values for made. And so those kinds of things would be more clear or explicit um, uh, providing the uh, X, Y coordinates is another question that's come up. So those kinds of things we can look at in detail when we look at the code for the homework and uh, what's provided as reference implementation in Colab. The, this here, he shows what happens um, when the, uh, uh, in a gated pixel CNN, again, in order to look at this, I believe we would look at the, let me go back to the video for a minute. Let me know if you can see my screen, the video part. Yes, yeah, we can see. Okay, so this one. Now I had a question here and would like comment if people have watched this. One of the things that was a little bit confusing to me uh, was, and he talks to it in the lecture, but not very clearly. And so again, we we'll have to look at the code in order to get a good idea. He says that, this is the receptive field we use that you see on the left. And we put the value here. Um, that's where we assign the value to is the point that is highlighted on the right of these matrices. But in the lecture, and also to be consistent with the autoregressive model, that doesn't seem to be correct because if we are using, if we are putting that you know, what we're computing on the left is the receptive field here, then we are violating because the thing is we are including the output from itself and also to its right. So this yellow single thing ought to be one row down if I understand the whole process correctly or what am I missing? Is there any explanation that people can provide to that? Is my understanding incorrect or what he has shown correct in some way that I'm misinterpreting? Any comments or thoughts? Again, it will become Not obviously. Too sure, um, I, I would have thought that he would have masked that lower right value that you talked about as zero, but I can't remember from the lectures. I'll have to watch it back again now. But I would have thought that yeah. you would have asked that. Yeah, exactly. That one, as well as the current pixel, right? Because you can't look at yourself either. So it's like, you can't look at that. Now, therefore, what he says in the lecture is, the way this is tackled in general in the gated and you know in the pixel tree, and is the fact that what you do is uh, actually just in the gated, not in the pixel, because the pixel CNN has the problem, is 
you calculate this, but you put the value here on the pixel below, because that, if you're focused on calculating for this pixel, the one below, then obviously you can use all of that. Now, in order to do that, you also then would need to include the pixel on your left. So this example seems, you know, to confuse things rather than to clarify things, at least to me. Um, but again, that will become very clear when we look at the code. But I just thought, you know, if he was wanting to explain it, he did a poor job of it because it confused me more than it clarified things. And in fact, he talks to it in the lecture saying, typically what is done in the gated pixel CNN is, the last row is dealt with differently than every other row. And that makes sense because if you look now, I'll switch to the stop sharing and switch to the slides. I think that's kind of what I'm pointing to right now. Let me see, know when you see it. But here he has this dotted line which says cut here. And can you see the slides? Yeah, looks clear. Okay, so with the cut here, it makes sense because everything above can contribute to any pixel on this row. Obviously within the row, only pixels on the left can contribute to the pixel that you're looking at or that you want to put the value at. That makes sense. But what he showed in the video uh, didn't make sense to me or it at least confused me. So yeah, I think I'm going to stick with looking, my understanding. Yeah, I was going to say, Go from ahead. looking at, yeah, so what you just described there, I think I agree. I think he might have made a mistake on the slides because if you look in the paper, it shows on the horizontal stack, um, it shows the next predicted value being the end, the, the right side of the horizontal um, convolutional yeah. filter, which is below yeah. the vertical stack. So, yeah, I think that was just a mistake on his slides. Yeah, that's okay. Glad you agree because at least I was thinking that that's a mistake, but I wanted input so feedback whether my thought process is correct. Okay, let's keep moving. Um, so vertical stack, horizontal stack, combining and allowing the parameters to be learned. Um, this is the setup for the gated pixel CNN where the vertical stack is on your left, the horizontal stack is on the right, and you have the feed uh, going from the vertical stack to the horizontal stack, but not in the reverse direction because you can't see or you're not allowed to see the future, you're only allowed to see the past. And again, this typical, you know, tanet sigmoid kind of structure with weights for each of them that you learn. Um, that's kind of the basic uh, setup for the gated uh, pixel CNN and the gated ResNet block, um, because there's also, as we'll see, uh, residual connections that are applied as well. So this is the gated pixel CNN and improvement on the pixel CNN, um, which allows for the gated pixel CNN allows elimination or at least reduction of the <clears throat> blind spot. Um, so better receptive field, more expressive architecture, therefore you get lower, uh, and in this case he points out that it's a NATS per dim because for a uniform distribution you're using eight bits. So that says, you yeah, know, the 2.9 is lower than the pixel CNN value uh, of 3.08, or another way to look at it for a test, the 3.03 versus 3.14. Um, then the pixel along comes the next improvement um, of pixel CNN so, plus uh, plus. I have a question yeah, on the ahead. previous slide. Yes. Um, so how, I, I really don't understand how what how are they measuring the performance um, of a of auto regressive architecture? Um, is it? Um, yeah, they um, he uh, covered it at the very end of the first lecture or the first part of 
the lecture that we looked at, it's essentially think of it as um, the metric is just basically this negative log likelihood. And that's what we use as the metric to compare, but we norm it to the dimensions because we obviously don't want, um, we want to compare it regardless of variations in dimension. So you use the log of the probabilities and depending on whether you use log to the base 10 or log to the base two um, of the probabilities, then that's what you use, which is if you use a log to the base 10, um, that's match per dim. And if you use log to the base two, that's bits per dim. And in both cases, you divide the value that you get by the dimensions, thereby normalizing the dimension value. But the negative log likelihood is essentially the log likelihood that you calculate. So if you go back and look at the very end of the uh, first half of the lecture, then he talks about, you essentially evaluate the log probabilities and divide by the number of dimensions. And that's how you score how well um, these networks are doing. Another way to think about it, I think is, that's why he touched on compression is, if you can compress something really well, then you're doing really good because you understand more of the network that, I mean, intuitively you can touch that. Therefore, the lower number of bits you use to code that stuff and the lower this score is, the better off your auto existing network is. So that's why you're trying to push these scores down as much as possible. Okay. Uh, yeah, that that makes sense. Yeah. So it, it is it is not about the images it generates, but um, it's it's about the um, yeah. Okay. From the training data. Yeah. Okay. But it's also about the images from the point of expressiveness. But there is no metric for ex expressiveness that I've seen. Meaning that you know, is it able to generate as much of the images that um, as much of the range of images that you would like to see, because obviously it can, you know, uh, generate get a very good score, but provide a very poor set of images in expressiveness. But I haven't seen, and maybe somebody else uh, who's more familiar can comment on it, but I haven't seen a metric for expressiveness. Uh, but at least this is the metric that we use to compare auto regressive networks. Okay, yeah, th that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Okay, the two improvements that Pixel CNN++ makes to the gated Pixel CNN are uh, one, the fact that um, we want or we know that pixels next to each other are likely to be close in color or close in values because you know that's the nature of the images. So, so far, neither the pixel CNN nor the CNN gated pixel CNN uses that concept or applies that in, uh, benefits from it in any way. The pixel CNN plus plus attempts to fix that. And the way it does attempt to fix that, I mean, the rest of it is detail. I'm just in, uh, in or important detail, but still I'm just trying to get there intuitively is to say that I'm going to uh, allow for pixels which are close to each other to be similar to each other. And the way I'm going to go about doing that is instead of just using a softmax, I'm going to model the output in such a way that it's a combination of some distributions. Uh, and by doing that, I'm allowing the learning to happen such that uh, the priors, which means that I already know before I get into the sampling that pixels close to each other are likely to resemble each other and be closer in the distribution values uh, as well, right? So that's kind of one of the ideas and the way then that they implement it is to make the output value instead of it being uh, softmax sampling, uh, change it to the sigmoid and a combination of the sigmoids, if you will, which then leads us to um, the distribution or the probabilistic, probabilistic distribution um, that's 
uh, what's the density and the density is expressed by this equation down below, assuming that the, um, <clears throat> the distribution we are parameterizing by, um, a, by a combination of sigmoid. Um, so instead of a combination of Gaussians, which would be a Gaussian mixture, in this case, it's, uh, we are trying to model uh, the priors by saying it's a combination of uh, sigmoid. That's at least uh, <clears throat> what I took away from this first part. So a mixture of multiple sigmoid logistic distributions is what we are now using instead of uh, softmax. And that in turn allows us to begin to model the dependencies or the relationship between adjacent pixels as files. Right, and the mixture can take any kind of a shape, and it kind of takes us to um, you know how the mixture of sigmoids uh, or logistics can be viewed as a distribution to meet, uh, as a CDF from which an appropriate PDF can be generated. So from this viewing the mix of sigmoid as a cumulative distribution, you can find the probability density of the pixel, which is what you're after eventually. Um, so that can then be used to train. Again, this is something which if you're implementing pixel CNN++ plus plus, um, in the, I, and I believe we are in the homework and, um, you know, then this would be another interesting point to see how this is set up and how it's used. And, you know, theory just says, hey, uh, we are trying to learn the sigmoid underlying uh, mixture of sigmoids that models this histogram, excuse me. And then we, you can see as we begin to train that the model begins to fit the data much better and the loss begins to go down. Now, the interesting comment linking back to the histogram example we saw earlier that he makes with it, um, is that if you were to just exactly fit the data rather than parameterize it using this combination of sigmoids, you would probably get a lower loss on this particular training example, but you would very poorly generalize. So that's the reason to parameterize this distribution of the current training example using something that's parameterized, which is a combination of this distribution, sigmoid distribution, or a combination of logistic distribution, rather than just learn the histogram for this particular training example. So that's one change that Pixel CNN++ makes. The other change it makes is related to kind of uh, the <clears throat> capturing long-term dependencies. And the way it does that is by uh, downsampling, which is to say that it provides the input. Remember that obviously this is again an auto encoder. So you, know, you start by, so this is the encoding piece, this is the decoding piece, if you will, and you start and provide the feed, uh, provide the residual or connections as well um, from uh, <clears throat> this part way to the same size network, but you go through and reduce the size and then you blow up the size again. And by doing that somewhat like a unit and stuff, then you begin to gain, gain benefits. The reason being that as you shrink the size, you are looking at farther and farther back in the network as well. So when you look farther back in the network, that means you're capturing the long, uh, sorry, log farther back in the image to the receptive field, then it means that you're capturing long-term dependencies uh, as well. So those are the two changes. Now, one other question, similarly to the previous thing I had, at least to me, it seems like, um, you know, in this uh, legend, there's a mistake, the convolutional connection, I believe are not the dotted ones, but the solid ones. Uh, because the identity skip connections are the dotted ones. Again, this particular second arrow, I think, should be a solid one because the convolutional connection is always going um, through these solid connections. So those are the two changes that Pixel CNN++ makes with respect to anything in uh, that we have seen before. And now we are even further down in the bits per pixel uh, 
metric that we just discussed. We are down to 2.92 versus 3.03 and so on. So any questions so far? Okay, so um, I think along this path of improvement, he finally just presents one slide. Obviously, we need to go through the entire paper, I guess, offline to understand it, which is called their own improvements on this whole pixel CNN concept. We saw pixel CNN, then gated pixel CNN. We, got, we saw pixel CNN plus plus. Where we are headed towards is the pixel snail, which I guess, uh, you know, the professor and a few of his students themselves came up. Um, the, I guess, uh, I say I guess because I haven't uh, spent time reading that particular paper, but one of the important concepts that get applied, I'm sure in that paper, um, but is relevant in general to uh, autoregressive networks that are, I guess, improved is the concept of attention and how that uh, attention combined with autoregressive networks can help us. So he spent some time looking at attention. If you have already, you know, are familiar with the attention concept, then it's uh, fairly easy to understand, but let's go through that uh, uh, as he takes us through uh, how uh, attention helps. Conceptually, if you already have exposed to attention, you uh, and especially dot product attention, you understand that uh, um, you know attention allows you to look at everything uh, that is potentially um, has an impact on you. So, for example, in BERT and so on, with self attention, it's just uh, you know one piece of or one word in a sentence. Uh, uh, with respect to all other words in that uh, sentence that you're talking about the attention. Um, and therefore, what that allows, that kind of uh, a concept of attention allows us to do is remove this limit that convolutional, that convolution imposes on us, which is to, you know, you, in convolution, you can only begin through the receptive field to consider the impact of the past uh, on you, whereas with attention, that kind of restriction is thrown to the winds. You can pretty much look at everything, um, and the only problem then is much like made, you just have to mask out those things which lie in your future or uh, the quote horizontal connection in made that is left unconnected. So attention, kind of in a simplistic way, takes allows us to up still use the structure that is inherent in an image while removing the shackles of the convolutional network, which limits us having to go through the past through this multiple layers of uh, convolutions and therefore an ever expanding receptive field. So the receptive field is the way we get to the past in convolutional networks. Attention kind of throws that away and gets us the past much more easily. And then it's again reduced to the masking problem to be consistent to the autoregressive uh, concepts. So he takes us through key query, key, and value. And we can think of the, um, you know, the query as being any particular input. It's some kind of a hidden vector, which is of any given dimension. And the query then is something that we use to find from among these keys, what key is closest to the query that we are providing. So think of query as an input that you want to find from among the values that exist in what you're looking at, which value is closest to you, but you do that through a match to a dictionary-like structure, if you will, where the keys are what you are comparing against. Now, again, in language models, we'll, you know, people who are familiar with it, the key, the query key and value are all of the same dimensions and the key and values at least in uh, the attention paper are kept the same, so on and so forth. But those are details. The concept is you're trying to get the match which best fits or is closest um, to the query and the key. So when you do a dot product, the larger the dot product of the query and the key, the better the match. And then you do a uh, softmax like uh, you know, weighted calculations of the values in order to generate what is known as, uh, so it's a normalized uh, normalization that's done here. 
uh, weighted normalization in order to calculate the attention value. Now, he also talks about the fact that, you know, this is likely to be unstable, so you so subtract from it the max in order to get numerical stability and so on and so forth. So the point is that if you were to use the concept of attention in the language model, then you're kind of uh, conceptually saying, I have a query or a word, and I have many contexts for this word, and which of the contexts is the most relevant in this particular instance um, that I've used the word in in the sentence. And that's kind of what this whole attention concept helps us to do. That is find the context that's most relevant or applicable to this word when the word is used in this sentence among the many concepts that are all represented by the dimensions of the word when it's encoded. So that's, uh, you know, high level attention concept and you can read the paper on attention as well as there are tons of videos explaining the attention concept in a word or language models, um, which do a fantastic job of explaining the concept of attention and how the query key and values and so on work. Um, and so this concept of attention when it's applied to our problem of finding out um, you know, the dependencies of the current pixel, what all it depends on in the past, the improvements that it provides are, it provides us an unlimited receptive field. And the scaling, the parameter scaling is of the order of one with respect to the data dimension. And you can compute in parallel versus having to do it in sequence as is done with RNN. So that's one of the reasons that attention has uh, kind of took the world by storm and got much better results and so on. It kind of removed the sequential nature of RNNs uh, as well. So those are the multiple of benefits that we get from using attention in our applying attention to our current problem. And so this is kind of a summary, if you will, of what is the uh, issue, I mean, demonstrated in a single attempt to demonstrate in a single pic picture. The idea being that in convolution, you have to go through multiple layers and kind of through an expanding receptive field to find out all of the pixels in the past that contribute to the value of the current pixel. And in case of self attention, boom, with a single calculation done in parallel, you can kind of find all of the past. The only problem you now have is that you need to still mask or drop a connection from the future and from yourself. So masked attention, um, practical thing he says is, so how do you implement the mask in case of attention? Uh, I just said we need to mask certain values. So how do we, I mean, it's easy to determine the pixels for whom the attention should be masked, but how do we mask it? Well, it's easy enough. If for those particular pixels, you just make that value very large when you compute this particular uh, equation. And you do that by providing a very large negative value. And that in turn makes the uh, masking effective by making the value of the pixels go to zero. So that's how masked attention is used and applied with respect to the pixel CNN and you combining this concept um, with what we have studied so far says uh, another beauty of um, attention is you no longer are restricted in ordering to the typical things we saw till now. You can kind of set up weird orders. Now I, you know, don't quite understand why you would want to do that, but in the search for does any particular ordering give you better results than just the raster scan ordering, you could potentially set up an ordering like what he has shown as zigzag ordering. And it would still, I mean, he says trivial, but I'd be very uh, interested in figuring out how such a mask ordering uh, can be implemented. It, conceptually, it's easy because it's just a matter of lining up the pixel coordinates and then making sure you mask in that order. But A, why would you want to do that? Um, you know, other than maybe 
thinking, hey, is any particular ordering give me, giving me better results than any other ordering? That could be one reason. But um, the point is you could do it without um, too much difficulty because attention allows you to kind of go back and look at any of the pixels. Therefore, it's just a matter of encoding the correct pixel coordinates that you need in sequence. But yeah, I still think until I see code, whether it's trivial to do, it's conceptually easy to do, um, but you know, we really need to see the code to see whether it's trivial. But then this is something, uh, he just shares a slide, he doesn't discuss or and or touch on it, but I guess this is the pixel snail uh, paper. I haven't looked at it and say much about it if anybody else wants to chime in and if they've spent any time looking at it to describe it, please feel free. Anyone? Okay, so this was the one paper that, uh, or at least um, details of which he didn't uh, take any time at all to cover. Um, so we have so far again, um, Pixel CNN, gated Pixel CNN, CNN plus plus, and then Pixel Snail. So he's kind of take us, taken us through four different variants of Pixel CNN, and in each case there's some improvement. Yeah, Pixel CNN has that, um, you know, the blind spot gated allows you to eliminate some of the blind spot. Uh, CNN plus plus brings in this uh, combination of logistics and um, the residual connections and or actually, sorry, the, also the fact that you are going farther back by um, having smaller size images uh, and working on them first. Um, those two concepts help us uh, with CNN++ and then there is the whole attention concept brought in to pixel snail. So each time we have kind of seen significant improvement. Um, here is a visual representation of the gated pixel CNN, and you can see that the yellow pixel is the one that we are trying to predict using all of the past. Now you can see how little of the past it effectively uses, and that's because again of this, you know, distance in any kind of a recurrent network or any of those types of setups. The farther down the past you have to go, uh, the less its actual practical impact. So you can see that all of these dark blue, uh, all of these light blue pixels, while expected to contribute to the yellow pixels, uh, have very little impact on it. The impact is only in the range where it's black or very dark blue. And then with pixel CNN plus plus, which is you know kind of the third step along our path so far, it begins to bring in a significant portion of the vertical stack or pixels above this pixel. But you can see that again, there are huge chunks of um, pixels that ought to be influencing you, but do not. Uh, and then pixel snail is amazing, except as he says in, you know, in his comments that he doesn't understand quite why the right sliver here is in a different color and doesn't seem to influence this pixel, but you can see the, that it does a phenomenally good job of almost 100% uh, of the pixels on the vertical stack and 100% and of the pixels effectively in the horizontal stack influencing you. So you can see visually that the autoregressive nature of the pixel snail is superior to pixel CNN++ and gated pixel CNN. And even pixel CNN++ is much better than the gated pixel CNN. Any comments or questions? Okay, so in the remaining time, he takes us very quickly through a bunch of ideas, which again, uh, he doesn't dive into as much detail as he did with uh, gated pixels or the pixel CNN++, but which are still interesting. Uh, well, this is just before we go there, I guess just the uh, application of multi-headed self-attention on MNIST, um, and you can see it begins to give reasonable results uh, at the 20th uh, epoch. And uh, pixel snail, uh, if you recall, we were at 2.9 something 
previously and now we are down to 2.85 so you and this is on cfar 10 as well uh, i forget whether the others were but uh, on what whether it was on mnist or cfar 10 or what kind of uh, images they were at but at least this is an apples to apples comparison and pixel cnn plus plus is at 2.92 we are down to 2.85 I assume this is test, although it doesn't say it clearly. Um, the other concept that he introduces quickly, and this is another one of these where at least I would, I can't say that I fully grasp it, uh, how it's done and uh, the details are in the code. Uh, which is conditional sampling and uh, allowing the uh, conditionality to influence what the autoregressive model produces. Here he's just trying to compare the quality of uh, a GAN versus an autoregressive model, illustrating that the autoregressive models can get very close to sometimes can even be as good or better than the GAN models. Um, the autoregressive model can have good samples and you can generate, and this is the point where it gets into the conditional modeling, good samples can be achieved by selective bits conditioning. And that's where there are two types of network, grayscale pixel CNN and subscale pixel networks. Uh, this is where the conditionality or introducing conditionality into what we have studied so far of pixel CNN plus plus or snail pixel CNN begins to be a factor and the class conditional pixel CNN. So how do you condition um, your output? And he says, do you one hot encode the labels? And then, and this is the part which, again, if somebody has done it and is familiar with it, please feel free to chime in and explain in more detail. But it seems to me what they are doing is one hot encoding the labels and using that to um, influence, if you will, uh, the value that we are outputting by multiplying the different learned weight matrices in each of the convolutional layer and adding as a bias. So we are using the one out encoding and providing it as a bias channel wise. So if we have, for example, multiple channels, then RGB, then we would do it in each of the channels but we would broadcast it spatially, which means that for the entire 28 by 28, we probably broadcast, but then we would do the um, you know, addition on to the bias uh, channel wise. But again, these are just a bunch of words. And I think this is another instance of where um, going through the code. Uh, and this is you know somewhat of a pointer or request to um, whoever is covering the uh, sections on coding and collab for homework coding and collab is kind of, you know, pay maybe a little more attention to how these things are implemented in the code, because these are at least to me open questions um, <clears throat> that need some focused attention when we get to implementing the class conditional pixel CNN. So somehow we use the, uh, not somehow, I mean, the process is described here, but it's uh, essentially using the labels and then introducing it as a bias, but broadcasting it specially into the weight matrices that are used to generate the outputs. That's how we selectively begin to push the autoregressive model to generate the conditional output. Any comments? Anybody tried this or played with it to be able to talk to it in more detail or uh, because I kind of talked about it in an abstract sense, but we really need to look at the code to get the details correct of how this is done. Okay, if not, let's, uh, so uh, the, the next paper along the lines of, you know, conditionality combined with yet another concept we'll see in a minute is the hierarchical autoregressive image models with auxiliary uh, decoders. So in this case, um, the idea is to condition it, but also to put a hierarchy. And the hierarchy is, uh, it's something that if you 
kind of look uh, or uh, taken past AI courses, we kind of, Jeremy refers to it as progressive resizing uh, in terms of learning uh, things and stuff. So here you generate an image, but you generate a low resolution image. So you generate, let's say, even for a 28 by 28 MNIST, but of course this is much larger pixel images, but let's say we stick with the example of a 28 by 28 MNIST, you maybe generate a seven by seven MNIST, then go to a 14 by 14 MNIST, and then go to a 28 by 28 MNIST. The, and in each case, as you progress through that, you condition the 14 by 14 on the seven by seven, and you condition the 28 by 28 on the 14 by 14. And obviously you can, by what we saw on the conditioning on the output labels, you can, you know, in the previous slide, you can kind of begin to see that um, you know, at a lower resolution, you generate some set of values for the higher resolution. If you condition on the lower resolution images, then you're likely to get a better uh, uh, values for that output. So that's the way these images are generated and the progress of, and the process of how to do that is what is described in this paper. Again, something that you need to look at. The concept is easy enough to grasp, but um, you know, the details I'm sure are not all that uh, trivial. So the idea here is this, the new idea here introduced is the hierarchical. So you do it for uh, low resolution images and then um, do it subsequently for high resolution and uh, improve or increase the resolution. The other reason why this works, he explains, or why this improves things is when you are in a low resolution image, then you don't have to look as far back. A seven by seven is obviously not very far back. Whereas if you are in a million pixel by million or even in a 28 by 28, in order for past pixels to influence you, there are many more past pixels. Whereas in a seven by seven, you know, the farthest you are from any old pixel for you to influence is much less, thereby making it possible for your network to allow that influence to happen. Um, so that's where conditioning on the subsample version to generate higher resolution is what um, allows you, uh, or that's the new thing introduced in this paper with respect to the autoregressive models. Um, so that's where you know a pixel CNN conditioned on a seven by seven subsample MNIST to generate the corresponding twenty eight by twenty eight image is what uh, is this guy. Uh, and then he says, you know, you can use this for very uh, high super resolution images. And it's basically pixel recursive because it's auto regressive. You go from eight by eight, these are images I think in the rooms and stuff. And these are facial images. You go from eight by eight, put 32 by 32 sample and the ground truth. And you can kind of begin to see uh, a much more, uh, you know, resemblance of the 32 by 32 sample as you go through the hierarchical process. Um, and this concept of hierarchy can be applied from a resolution standpoint. So you start with low resolution of seven by seven going to bigger uh, resolutions and stuff. But the, another way to apply it is to apply it in the color dimension. So you can also view color, meaning the number of channels as a hierarchical thing. And then you learn something on binary and you apply it to the color that's another way uh, to also think of and apply uh, what you're learning. <clears throat> so you condition on the grayscale and then move to color. So you've learned a bunch of things with respect to the image that are relevant in a black and white context and then bring in the color aspect, if you will. So I can see the, you know, the point he explains is you can kind of set the structure uh, and then you can bring in the color. And if you try to do it all at once, you're trying to do it in too many dimensions and that in turn prevents how much the network can learn. Um, uh, the distances in higher dimensions are much more vast, um, if you will. So that's what this particular grayscale pixel CNN I think this is an optional exercise, but obviously since we will be looking at, you know, the reference implementation and uh, in the homework as well, this will be another good example of uh, going through the code of how the hierarchical concept is applied 
to move from the grayscale to the color uh, images or using the, um, I think, MNIST colored or colored MNIST data set if I'm not mistaken. And this is, you know, pixel CNN models with auxiliary variables for natural image modeling, kind of same concept, conditioning on some values to provide the new output. So uh, summarizing what we have seen so far, the neural autoregressive models, what is good about autoregressive models in general? The good things are they're very expressive. They seem to be able to generate most of what we see in the input. So the factorization, that means that what we learn uh, from the network seems to be good. And it's generalization ability is also uh, good. So it's able to utilize the parameter sharing in a way to give us a good inference. Uh, so it does provide us with state-of-the-art models and multiple data sets. The issue though is the problem that we've already discussed. That is for one forward pass uh, is needed for each of the pixels in the image. So as the image grows, you can imagine how many cycles of uh, forward passes we have to go through. And in the past, it was, you know, order of minutes, probably order of minutes even now to generate CFAR images, which are 32 by 32. So that's kind of the drawback of masked autoregressive images. Fairly easy to implement uh, and, um, you know, very expressive, but slow. Um, the two methods that he talks about to improve the speed are covered in the next couple of slides. So given that we know that the inference is kind of the bottleneck of autoregressive model, so how do we tackle that? Well, if we look at WaveNet to, uh, to pick an example of how things could be speeded up, one is through caching. So given our, you know, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> usage of the past, um, what we can do is every time we calculate, we can store away the data in caches and kind of uh, or cache the day, uh, results, if you will, thereby not re-going through the calculations if we have already done them in the past and if the values of the inputs have not changed. So in a naive implementation, in order to calculate the value of the pixel Y, you would go through all of the calculations. So even, you know, starting at the bottom with the blue pixels, go through the set of, let's say, two, um, two by one matrices here to get this set of pixels, then another two by one, two, two by ones here, and then a one, two by one here to get to this. But you can be smarter than that because you can figure out which of these calculations, and in this case, he explains that everything except this vertical guy here is previously calculated and its inputs, given that we have kind of a dilated convolution, its values have not changed because these inputs have not changed. The only thing that's changed is the rightmost slice of the picture on the left. So that's what is shown here, that if we apply a particular level of dilation, you could store our, uh, you know, pre-computed values, just reuse them rather than going through the computation. And that ought to significantly speed up our implementation. And the reference code is there in the GitHub link that he provides, right? And he kind of goes through how much you can improve your batch size, thereby, you know, improving your speed of your inference as you do this, uh, caching of computed values. Um, the other way you can do this, the second way that you can speed up the whole calculation is by, uh, so one other comment uh, with respect to the caching is in caching, we are in no way uh, adversely impacting the quality of the output because everything else remains the same. It's just that we are storing pre-computed values and using them rather than computing them on the fly every time. So all we are doing is reducing the number of computes that we need to do to compute the output. In case of 
The second method will actually be impacting the uh, quality of the output somewhat. The desired goal is obviously to have as minimum the impact while benefiting the most from the speed up. The idea is you divide the range of your image into say subsections and then allow only the subsections pixels to influence your output. So another way to think about it conceptually is to say, remember we were talking always in this uh, set of autoregressive models of masking or import. So one way to think about it is in this case, when we do divide the entire image into sections and allow only pixels in a particular section to influence each other, what we are essentially doing when we do that, let's say we prevent in the first four blocks is what we are focused on and we disallow any pixels in the other remaining four block chunks uh, to influence pixels in this chunk. Then what we are essentially doing conceptually is we are masking all of these pixels from influencing the pixels in this space. So think of this method of hierarchical kind of dependencies uh, is of implementing a lot more masking than what is actually required by autoregressive modeling. So as soon as you say that, we also can understand that by, but by doing that, we are reducing or eliminating the impact of these pixels, especially in the past, from influencing the value of the pixel here. So that obviously might influence the quality of the picture. That's why we, in fact, we went from pixel CNN to gated to you know CNN plus plus. But in order to do speed up, and if we uh, you know such a division might be helpful. And again, if we do it in a smart way, as is described in the rest of this slide, then maybe we can gain most of the benefit while not impacting quality too badly. So that's essentially what the hierarchical or you know speed up by breaking the autoregressive pattern. So in one case, by caching, you have no impact on quality and you get all the benefit by just pre-computing. In this case, you disallow certain pixels. Basically, you mask more than what you need to do by autoregressive patterns and conceptually divide up the image. Don't allow faraway pixels to influence, only allow closer pixels to influence and thereby speed it up again. But in this case, you run the risk of things impacting or you actually are impacting the quality depending on how smartly or poorly you do the job of dividing up the image. Uh, so in this particular approach, you trade expressivity for sampling speed. That's the downfall of this approach. Any questions? Okay, so here he just comp compares the speed up that you get when you uh, you know, and obviously the speed up is in sampling. In training, there's no problem because you just provide the input and the output and you go through the cycle and it trains itself really fast. But it's the sampling where you have to go through each of, um, you know, for each pixel, you have to go through the forward pass as many times as you've seen in the past. So the speed up is of the sampling speed, okay? And that's kind of gives you the relative result of what's done when you can use this multi-scale approach to pixel CNN. And um, he just goes on to, and you know, I think this is really cool as well, is he goes on to say that you can apply this and this particular paper talks about uh, applying this technique to video and being able to kind of really get significant uh, performance of the <clears throat> uh, scaling of the autoregressive model. So, you know, a 32 frame idea, you, uh, 32 frame video, uh, you use this concept that we just discussed of first generating the yellow pixels. So you can see in this uh, first slice, you first generate the yellow, then you generate um, <clears throat> the green, the red, then the blue. Uh, and this hierarchical generation scheme, you know, uh, as we have seen in the previous case for 2D, but now applied in the video. So you go from computing yellows to greens to red to blues, and that 
allows you to kind of really provide uh, much faster uh, capabilities to scaling video models and applying autoregressive concepts to video models. So uh, you're doing the hierarchy for video in not just the X and Y dimension, but also in the time dimension. You can think of it in this way, right? So you generate the first and the fifth frame kind of coarsely, and then fill in the second, third, and the fourth frame. So the same concepts which were used in 2D are now brought into the 3D as, uh, or the dimension of time as well, and the dimensions of the channels, right? So kind of, again, I haven't read through the paper, but it provides us the background we need to understand how um, such an idea could be implemented in uh, scaling autoregressive models and generating autoregressive frames, so to speak, in a video context. Right, and the one last concept um, that he touches on, which is fairly important, is at the end of the day, we are doing a lot of, um, again, he uses a couple of videos to illustrate how well or poorly, um, <clears throat> you know, the autoregressive video models do. I'm gonna skip that. You can look at that in his video lecture. Um, the last concept I'll touch on in order for us to end on time, <laughs> Today is this, um, how do you, yet another way of manipulating autoregressive models uh, using something that um, called Fisher scores. Um, why do we want to do this? Uh, uh, or what are we after? The point here is, Typically, we do a lot of these autoregressive uh, models and so on in order or unsupervised learning in general is to learn representations of the underlying data. Um, in this case, uh, when I say this case, I mean in the case of autoregressive models, what is the representation that we have learned by anything we have done so far to Pixel CNN or CNN++, blah, blah. blah, blah. They just produced outputs or produced probability given an image of whether it is in your distribution. So we just generated the output distribution. But what we haven't done is kind of understood or be able to manipulate uh, or figure out the underlying representation of those images that the network has learned or manipulate it in some way. So the question is, how do we get to that with these autoregressive models? And one of the simple solutions that is proposed uh, in this paper is to use the Fisher score, which is nothing but the gradients of the distributions that we see in the autoregressive models. So how do you get a latent representation from the pixel CNN? Uh, so the latent representation you can think of as the hidden state that you get in uh, an RNN, as analogous to the hidden state that you get in an RNN network. So for your pixel CNN, what's the analog to the hidden state? That's kind of what we are after. Why, we are at, why are we after that? Because by manipulating the hidden state, we hope to be able to get some set of uh, images. And by combining, as we'll see in a minute, a couple of hidden states, we hope to be able to combine images that we are providing as input. So by manipulating what the representations are in this latent space, we expect or hope to be able to manipulate the original images better in the input space. So that's kind of the idea, but how do we get that? So the idea in this case is for any likelihood model, you just, you know, you take the um, <clears throat> gradients of the log uh, likelihood that you're computing and use that itself as the score. Um, again, for those of you who have kind of followed the deep learning PyTorch uh, course, uh, there's a guy, uh, and again, I'm, uh, I'll see that I can, uh, I'll be able to post the link to the lecture that I'm talking about. It's a two hour lecture by a guest lecture by a researcher from Facebook. He talks about many of the, uh, 
<clears throat> you know, uh, variational autoencoding models that we'll get to in this set of lectures, probably in two to three lectures down the road. But the point is, he talks about how clustering helps in improving such self-supervised models. And if you listen to this particular lecture also, especially when it comes to the Fisher score, um, the point he's trying to make is if we have if we imagine the output to be a combination of kind of different set of distributions, like a Gaussian mixture model, or as we saw, a combination of uh, you know sigma distributions and stuff, then he says that you can think of it as you know the Fisher score indicating that if I belong to cluster one, then these gradients ought to be indicating to me that I belong that this image belongs to cluster one and are higher probability of belonging to cluster one. And if there is a certain other distribution and therefore a different image, then this uh, gradient ought to indicate that the probability of me belonging to the second cluster of images is high. You can conceptually think of, therefore, these gradients as indicating which of the clusters that if you provide images from two different clusters, then the probability or this particular Fisher score ought to be indicative of which of the clusters the images belong to. So by manipulating it, then you can combine an image and generate an image which kind of is in between those clusters, so to speak. That's again, an intuitive explanation of why the gradients act as, the, as a good score uh, for the uh, latent representation of uh, the models generated by autoregressive methods. So then he goes into, um, you know, the example of interpolation and, you know, even better than, uh, and from left to right, I think the right is the um, things that you start from the left image and then you move to the right image. The point he makes, and it's much better visualized in the last example if he says look at how you do this uh, or the difference between how it's done when you look at the top set of images and you look at the bottom set of images and the bottom set of images seem to blend the two images uh, which are this leftmost image and this rightmost image and what you want in the middle is something that's a blend of these two images but still very much is an image and is part of what you would think is the distribution that encompasses both of these images. And what you see in the top is literally just a superposition. So here you can kind of see that it just slapped this guy's face on this lady's face and you know the result is what is output here. Whereas here in the bottom row, you could begin to see that the output that the network generates is still very much within the what one would think is the distribution that encompasses, and uh, you know, if I were to use the same language, the cluster of uh, both of these image distributions. Therefore, it seems to be a much more natural blend in this middle ground than the simple superposition that you see here. So that's what the using the Fisher scores and using them to kind of uh, help us to interpolate between um, the set of distributions that these two images represent. So that's where you know the Fisher scores help us to then create, if you will, a latent representation or at least manipulate a latent representation which we have not had with inherently through the autoregressive models. Okay, I think we finished in good time. Any questions or discussions or points people want to make? Yeah, I, I think the first obvious one is, uh, I mean, the, the the new new things that have come come out with using self attention, right? Be purely just based on self attention, uh, like OpenAI's and uh, the Facebook paper. 
I don't know how much of it is obsolete or how much is still relevant. That's the one question that I was thinking is, is, is mask model still an important research topic or is, you know, is self-attention probably just said, you know, it does, it's not, doesn't matter. Uh, I, I don't know in practice, I haven't looked at it in great detail, but I think, you know, many of these, the way I look at it are foundational concepts that help you regardless of, and also, uh, you know, there are, as with any other research topic, these things have, uh, the foundational concepts help us in applying the same ideas in a variety of fields. So while it may not be, you know, while MAID may not be, or applying MAID to uh, MNIST may not, you know, be very practical or relevant. It's relevant in understanding the basic concepts of how autoregressive models work to get to an understanding of what the self-attention networks do and how and why masking applies in a particular way. Yeah, it would would be good to know how the metrics uh, uh, stack up with the, the latest research. I think it, two years have passed, or is it a year and a half uh, since this? It's 2020 to uh, when it was taught, spring of 2020. Oh, okay. So we're a little over a year. Of, uh, okay. Uh, but you know, research in this domain proceeds fast. He has mentioned, for example, that one of the things that was an open question when the course was taught in 2019 was how can you, you know, can you, one of the things we, I didn't touch on is you can begin to generate now, I guess with pixel snail and other things, not just the 28 by 28 MNIST image, but possibly going to let's say 56 by 56 MNIST images. So size uh, invariant generation using autoregressive networks. And that was an open question in 19 when they taught, but that's with all the improvements to pixel CNN, apparently that problem has been solved meaning that you can generate bigger pixels than what you, uh, or bigger sized images than what you start off with by, uh, when you train. And so that's a solved problem. It wasn't solved when he taught it in 19. So obviously, you know, research in this area is progressing furiously, but as with many things, understanding in my assessment, understanding the fundamental concepts that go into these things are important to be able to, uh, you know, and they don't go away, they come back in different ways ways and forms um, over time. So I think understanding the basic concepts, I think are still valuable. So while made might never be practical, um, I, I, you know, without grasping that, I would have a hard time understanding pixel CNN or CNN++ or what is being done in those networks and why we do what we do. Uh, since we have hard stop at one, uh, just wanted to one minute to talk about. I'm I'm doing the homework next week and then the um, collab the week after. Uh, what format do we want to uh, do that? My plan was to start a thread um, on Slack with just the homework one. So if we have any questions or discussions, we can just post it there. Um, but for the next for the next week, how do we just want to go through the problem? Um, I know the yeah, solution I, is. I think, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I think, you know, given the complexity, if you, yeah, it would be great to start the Slack uh, thread and have people post links and or, you know, their questions and stuff. But as for the two, uh, uh, you know, we have four hours total or a little less than that, uh, <clears throat> right? If we uh, <clears throat> stop in time and so on. So I would say, it would be great if you can take us to the code implementation and kind of highlight, you know, the relevant questions that came up as we discussed, uh, you know, how do we combine the vertical and the uh, horizontal stack? How do we ensure that we have, uh, uh, the weight training there happens? And, um, you know, how do we code the uh, position and provide it to mate? Or how do we combine the discretized or, uh, sorry, the, um, Sigma distributions. Um, uh, so many questions remain, the details of which are vague. And if you can take us through the homework code uh, and subsequently the collab code, most of them cover the same space, but maybe in slightly different ways. So if you can take us through the code and kind of explain 
how not, uh, the relevant problems are handled that would be great at least from my perspective if anybody else has any other suggestions please feel free to chime in yep uh, i think the some of the details are hidden in their python package but uh, yeah um you can go through both of them um we have to implement like a a a, a small part of it and then send it to their um, package to do the uh, majority of the work. Uh, but yeah, okay, we can have more discussion and then um, however it goes, then I can I can plan around that. Okay, Yeah. thank you. So, you know, if you can take us through the, uh, and, you know, it's okay, I think the Slack thread can serve as, you know, our attempt to solve it. And then given the limitation in time, you may just want to kind of take us through the, homework solutions and kind of where or what you attempted, what wasn't clear and thereby what became clear when you looked at their reference implementation and how they have solved those problems. And I'll try and post links of other people attempting to implement it. So you could potentially look at that and compare that to their implementation as well. Okay, yeah, that, that sounds good. Yeah, you had a, um, some some of the questions that you want you wanted to ask, but I think I got some of them, but didn't get all of them. So if you could also post like, oh, these are the things that uh, would be good to look into further. Yeah, that would be great. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll do that. Okay, thank you. I'll 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 start the thread. Okay. Any other thoughts? It's obviously a lot uh, to go through, uh, but that's the reason I provided. You know to other sessions of homework so, uh, and collab, so we can kind of get into the details of the code uh, more than just the concepts, um, but it is a graduate level course, so it's to be expected. Okay, thanks everybody for joining and hopefully I'll get offline with the tutorial staff and by next week we'll not have logistical problems. Thanks very much. Yep. Thank thanks you. very much. Really interesting, quite challenging as well, but thanks very much for going through. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.